like to thank you for this wonderful day. We'd like to take this time to give back to you for all the material and financial blessings you have given us. As you guide us and watch over us, let us give back cheerfully. This is, we you know you don't need our money, Lord, but it is just to show us to say thank you for everything that you have truly done for us. Guide us and watch over us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 transfer from one computer to another. I'm sorry. I couldn't find, my adapter is missing. So I don't know what's happened to it. Sing another song. Uh, yeah, give me like five minutes. to say? The unclouded day? Sounds good. What page is the unclouded day on? as I play it. Not yet. Is it even in the Jimmy Davis? It's in the Jimmy Davis. But what page? Would you like to leave this on? And I'll play? Yeah. Sure you Come on up here. You don't want me. Come on, no, we need you to leave. Come on, Roy. Let's go. It's group effort. Let's go. It's the unclouded day. Nice. Nice. Oh, yeah. He's looking at it up. Uh, I remember when we were in Cooper used to sing that on the brand new line. It is 225. 225. You know I can't sing.
and she was in there cooking me some eggs. And uh, I walked in the kitchen, you know, I just went barreling into the kitchen. I said, look, look, be careful how you turn those over. Now, be easy, be easy. Put some salt, put some salt, and be easy. Turn them over easy. Ah, you're going to mess them up. You're going to mess them up. Look out, look out, look out. And she looked at me and said, have you lost your mind thinking I don't know how to cook eggs? I said, I just want you to know how I feel when I'm driving. <laughs> you ready, Martha? I'm uh, as ready as I'm going to be. Because so. if we need another song, I was, I was going to say, let's, let's do something I know. <laughs> what? Next, next yes. time we'll do I Saw the Light. I know that.
people said, Amen. Amen. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but here's the well-known fact today. Because the tomb is empty, we have hope. Amen. Because the tomb is empty, it doesn't matter what you're going through in life, we have hope. And so this morning, we're going to look at the power of the empty tomb and what that means for us today. Last week, we talked about the power of the cross. And we studied the cross, but this week we're going to turn our attention to the empty tomb. So if you have your Bibles, take them and turn to 1 Corinthians this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll begin reading in verse 22. And if you're able, let's stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after those who are Christ. At his coming. And then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. And when he puts an end to all rule. And all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him. It is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. And now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for, for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. And if in the manner of men I have fought the beast at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat, drink, and for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Let us pray. Father, we... Thank you for your day, for this day, Lord, that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for your word today. God, we thank you that because of the fact that the tomb is empty, Lord, we have hope. Father, let us not miss this important day today, this important message that you have for us today. And we pray these things in that name that's above every name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want all of us to have a better grasp this morning as to why it is that we as Christians, we celebrate <laughs> Jesus and we celebrate this empty tomb every spring. Why Jesus' resurrection, why is that such a big deal for us today? And I want to begin by pointing out uh, that, that, that first Easter Sunday is not just a story that we read about. It's not just a work of fiction, just like we talked about last week when we talked about the cross. Easter is not some pipe dream, some fantasy. It's not based on superstition like many other spring celebrations are. No, the resurrection of Jesus is indeed a fact. Amen. And you can go today, just like I got the wonderful experience to go to Israel a few weeks ago, and you can see, and you can walk in the empty tomb. And I, I gave Martha a picture, a couple of pictures this morning of the empty tomb today. And uh, if you keep going, there's inside the empty tomb. It's just an amazing sight when you go inside the empty tomb and you just feel the weight of the fact that Jesus was buried, but and in the third day he rose again. And so today, as we study this story. And we realize that the resurrection is real. It really happened. I'm thinking, I, I think about Tim Keller. And when he writes, the resurrection was not preached in the early church as a symbolic 
representation of wonderful higher truths like we all but always must keep hope or the resurrection was preached as a hard, bare, terribly irritating, paradigm-shattering, horribly inconvenient, but impossible to dismiss fact. And before we go any further this morning, let's do a quick review of what happened following Jesus' crucifixion, following his death, from what we talked about last week, if you were here. Jesus was nailed to those rough cross beams around 9 a.m. on the first Good Friday, and he hung there until his death at 3 p.m. that afternoon, and at that point in time, on that, he secured permission from Pontius Pilate to take Jesus' body down and place in a borrowed tomb a, a person by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a Pharisee. And a secret follower of Jesus was Joseph of Arimathea, and three of Jesus' female disciples, all named Mary, followed quickly behind Joseph and the others to the tomb. But since it was Sabbath, right, it was quickly approaching. The Sabbath was quickly approaching. The women did not have time to properly anoint Jesus' body for burial. And so they went home. And if you can imagine, on that Saturday, how quiet, how dark, how disturbing Saturday could have been, but Sunday was coming. Amen. Sunday was coming. <laughs> they came back on that third day, the first Easter Sunday, and when they arrived at the tomb, they discovered that the huge stone that was sitting in front of the, the tomb had, that had sealed Jesus' tomb, sealed his body in, had been rolled open. Plus the Roman soldiers who had been stationed there to, make, to guard the tomb, they were gone. And in their place were angels who gave these women literally the best news that they have ever heard in the history of this sorry planet that we live in. Amen. They said, he, Jesus, is not here, for he has risen just as he said he would do. Now at this point I could say there are tons of proofs that what the angel said that morning is true. Proofs that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And as I mentioned earlier, when I read about the linen cloths and the, and the, the face cloth and all of that, all of that points to the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead after his crucifixion. But I want us to take the time to zero in on just one proof this morning. One proof, and I'm talking about an otherwise unexplainable life-changing impact the resurrection had on this one man God used to write this text that we read this morning. The Apostle Paul. And as most of you know, Paul used to be called what? Saul. Saul. He used to be called Saul, and he was a Jew, and, and he was a Jew of the Jews. And he was a member of the highly esteemed tribe of Benjamin, a, a well-educated Pharisee, and I mean, if anyone was a Jew through and through, it would be Saul. And he was very proud of it. And I emphasize Saul, his strong Judaism, because Jewish people are the last people on the face of the earth to be open to the idea of a human being, that a human being could be God. And to believe that, to be preaching that kind of thing, well, that would be heresy. And so remember, it was Jesus' claim that he came and he claimed to be God that led the Jews to force the Romans to have him crucified. Now get this picture. My point this morning is claiming that a man was God would be going against everything of Saul's worldview that he believed. Everything. I mean, in Jesus' day, think about it. Jews wouldn't even say the name of God out loud. When they had vows to the Old Testament <coughs> scripture, they did it for every word except the name of God. They didn't do that. And to them, to say the name was too holy, to even say his words out loud, to say the word of God out loud, to pollute it. And so how would a prominent Jew like Saul, how would he come to worship a man named Jesus? How would he come to worship a man named Jesus who claimed that he was the son 
of God. And as many of you know, before Saul became a Christian, before he, he had this experience, like most of the Jewish religious leaders, he was offended by Christianity. And he hated the gospel message. He was seriously ticked by the idea that these, these Christians would, were proclaiming the idea there would be no more need for a temple. Imagine that. That thanks to Jesus' death on the cross, there need not be any more sacrifices for sin. And for the Jew, that would be hard, a hard concept to even grasp. And these revolutionary teachings that were outrageous to him, and he was so enraged by all of this, that he took a hiatus from his regular duties as a Pharisee, and made it his life goal, this man named Saul, made it his life goal to arrest, to imprison, and to even as kill as many Christians as he could. He wanted to wipe this religious stuff off the face of the earth, what these new Christians were doing. But then something happened. Something happened. Something that shattered Saul's deeply held conviction. And that something was someone that he met when he was traveling on the Damascus Road. And that day Saul saw and talked to the risen Christ. And on that road, Saul was, was confronted. He was confronted with an unshakable fact that Jesus was who had been crucified, Jesus was killed. Jesus was buried, he had risen, and he was alive. And that's the man that Paul was faced with. You know that many of the people are just as offended by Christianity today. Think about it. I mean, there are lots of, of Saul's that are running around in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and they don't like the Bible's teaching on creation, and they try to explain it away scientifically. They, lie, they laugh at stories that we read about as children growing up, like the stories of Noah and the flood, and Moses parting the Red Sea, and Jonah living in the belly of a huge fish. And they think that this, all this biblical accounts are like, that they're just ridiculous. They're just stories that are made up. And they're offended by the Bible's teachings on marriage and relationships. They're offended by a lot of the messages that are preached within the Bible. Well, the, first, the fact is the first Saul was more offended by Christianity than any of the current Saul's that we see today. But when this first Saul, when he realized that Jesus had indeed been risen from the dead, when he had indeed been raised, it didn't matter that Christianity offended him anymore. It didn't matter he, that, It didn't matter because he could see with his own two eyes that it was true. And he was met with this idea that Jesus was alive. Now I want you to remember something this morning. Think about this. Saul's conversion was a shocking thing to other Christians. Just think about it. To give us an idea of the shock that they felt, well, it would be like one of the Saul's of our day, the late, you ever know Stephen, Stephen Hawking, he's a, he was a devout atheist. I mean, just he was a blatant atheist. And having a news conference before he died and saying something like this, Stephen Hawkins, I was wrong. There really is a God. Jesus really is the son, his son. I saw him with my own eyes. The Bible is true. Creation, the flood, all of it is a picture of Jesus coming. People would think that Hawkins' ALS that he had had affected his brain. And that leads to something else we need to realize when it comes to understanding why we celebrate Jesus' empty tomb. And the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus is the key for us. And understanding the entire Bible. <clears throat> Knowing the resurrection and understanding the resurrection is key for us to understand the entire Bible. I mean, God's written word only makes sense if Easter is true. 
God's written word only makes sense if Easter is true, which it is because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Think about it, for example. The Jewish sacrificial system only makes sense, only makes sense if it points to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Why else would they sacrifice in the Old Testament? Doesn't make sense. The Jewish Passover meal only makes sense when you think about it paired with the resurrection. Missionaries from Jews for Jesus have, 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 have if, you, if you read stories about this, and these, these Jewish converts, <laughs> they come to this realization that, that it only makes sense if his resurrection happened. Think about the promises of Abraham's descendants you should read about. Blessing the whole world only makes sense if you realize that this happens through Christians sharing the good news of our risen Lord. That's the only way that that makes sense. But let's go back to Saul for a moment. The Bible says he met our risen Lord. The scripture says, now if Christ is preached... That he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? This is Paul preaching. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is what? Empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're st you are still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. There is no hope there. And if this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. The Bible says that Paul met the risen Lord. And what happened, if you remember the story on the Damascus Road, when Paul met the risen Lord, he was stricken blind for three days. Three days, imagine that. And in his book, Love of God, Don Carson reconstructs what might have been going on in Saul's mind. Put yourself in, in Saul's shoes for those three days, for just a moment this morning, in those 72 dark hours where he could not see. He points out that Saul, who was a Pharisee, remember I gave you a background on Saul a while ago, would indeed have been offended by Christianity for many reasons, and here's one. The Messiah, by de definition, would be anointed. In fact, the word Messiah means anointed one, which means the chosen one, the beloved one. And in other words, a Pharisee like Saul believed that a, the Messiah would have been blessed by God. And so the Messiah would have the favor of God. Think about it. He would please God. But here's this Jesus Christ. Here's Jesus claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be the Savior of the world, and yet he died on a cross. He died on a cross. And even the Romans knew that this was the most shameful way to die. The Romans knew all about crucifixion. And it was the most shameful way for someone to die. Everyone knew that to die on the cross was the bad end for people who were the lowest of low. And Saul would have been remembered, he would remember that Deuteronomy itself says this. Cursed is he who is hung on a tree. Cursed is he who is hung on a tree. And he also knew Jesus had cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Saul was probably standing there with the other Pharisees when Jesus said this. So here's a summary of Saul's thoughts those three days of darkness. When he could not see, when, his, when he was blinded in those three days. That first day that Paul was blinded, Christianity makes no sense because the Messiah would be blessed by God. He would be supported by God. He, it makes no sense because he would be accompanied by God. And this guy, Jesus, was abandoned by God. In his darkness, that's what Paul was thinking. 
In his darkness on that first day, Paul was thinking he was cursed. So what kind of salvation could a man cursed by God, a man that was abandoned by God, what kind of salvation could this man bring? But then Saul remembered the last thing that he saw before his eyesight was taken from him. From him. And what did he see? He was brought back to the fact that Jesus was standing there alive. That Jesus was standing there alive, raised from the dead, and he thinks, well, wait just a minute. If he is indeed risen from the dead, then God did vindicate him. Then God is pleased with him. Then God does love him, and God blesses him. So if God loves him and he is pleased with him, then Jesus must have been cursed and abandoned for somebody else's sin. Not his own. Now think about the weight of that. He must have been cursed and abandoned for somebody else's sin. That was the first day that he was blind. But think about the second day when he was sightless. Old Saul. And he turns to these Old Testament scriptures, which of course a Pharisee of a Pharisee would have all this around carried around in his head. Paul knew scripture and he had it memorized and he knew it and he was thinking and he would thought of Isaiah and what he said. And he would think, okay, in the first part of Isaiah, the Messiah is a great king, right? But the second half is all about the strange figure of the suffering servant. And he's got this idea, a king and then a, a suffering servant. They couldn't both be the same figure, could they? And he starts thinking to himself, yes, they could. And then he thinks of this, this precious temple that they would go to and, and the, sacrificial, the sacrificial system that they had in place. And these thoughts filled his mind. And think about these thoughts that might have been going through Saul's mind at this point. Did the blood of bulls and the blood of goats and little lambs, did they really over the years actually completely atone for sin? Did they actually atone for sin? When he starts to think to himself, that wouldn't make much sense at all, would it? But what if it wasn't supposed to atone for the sins? What if the purpose of all these sacrificial sacrifices and all this was to point to something or to someone else? What if all that this was pointing to this guy named Jesus? But what if it's all pointing to Jesus? What does that mean about the temple? And what does that mean about this sacrificial system? And then when he awakes on his third day of blindness, all mind, his mind goes to Ezekiel and to Jeremiah, and he thinks, look at those places where it talks about a new covenant in the Old Testament, where it seems like God is actually talking to people face to face and, and, and writing the law on their hearts. And it's almost like there's no need for a priest and there's no need for a temple anymore. What is that new covenant? What is that discussion all about? How do we understand that? Well, with Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection, it, it all makes sense. What about the promise to Abraham? To, to, through Abraham's descendants, all nations of the world, it says, would be blessed. How would that ever happen? How would that ever come true. And he thinks perhaps through Christians, followers of Jesus becoming children of God through <laughs> faith. And the question is, do you see what's going on here in the life of Saul? And once Saul, once he got a picture, once he understood the resurrection, he understood the cross. He looked back on the entire Old Testament. Think about this. And, it, and the whole Old Testament opened up to him. And, and Paul had been expecting a strong Messiah to come and to save the strong. His understanding was that the, the Messiah would have gotten up on a horse and he would have saved all those who summoned up their strength to follow him and obey him fully. So it would have been a strong Messiah coming to save the strong. But as Saul sat back and he thought about this, he suddenly realized... Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. It's a, it's, a, it's a Messiah coming in weakness. It's a Messiah coming in weakness to save those who have admit that they're, they're weak. 
and admit that they need a Savior. And once he saw it, once he got it, it opened everything up to him, including his own eyes. <laughs> and God sent a Christian named Ananias to the house where Saul was staying. And you remember the story. And Saul professed his faith in Jesus Christ right then and there. And it changed his life forevermore. And we know it did because you can read most of the New Testament and see what Paul was all about. Ananias placed his hands on Saul's eyes and he was healed. And I can't help but think of Saul's three days in darkness. Like Jesus three days in the tomb. And to think that Saul was dead. Spiritually dead. He was dead in his sins and then he was reborn to new life. And that's the way it is for everyone who puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. The resurrection is indeed the key to understanding the entire Bible from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 all the way to the end. It's the whole story points to Jesus, the Messiah. The whole book does. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 puts it this way, all the promises of God find their yes, find their understanding, listen to this, in our risen Lord. Everything, the answers to all of our questions that we may have, all of our disappointments, all of our heartache, all of our, our depression, all everything, all questions are found in Jesus in the fact that he is risen. Amen. He is the risen Lord. He's our risen Lord indeed. And this helps us to understand the empty tomb and the importance of the empty tomb. And I want to explain why it is that Christians, why we celebrate Easter. Why we come together and celebrate Easter. Because first it is a time to celebrate the forgiveness of God. Think about it. Paul says in our text, if Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. We are still in our sins. I mean, Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the foundation, foundational block of our faith. And without it, we are without hope. And we cannot be reconciled unto a holy God. We cannot be. How many of you love to play Jenga? Anybody love that game? Nobody? Okay, good. Then this, this illustration won't make sense. You'll love it, right? And you know how the game ends, right? Anybody that's ever played it? Now, if you're carefully pulling blocks away from the, the game, from the bottom of the stack, and carefully putting them on top, and you just continue to do that, eventually one player pulls one too many blocks, and what happens? The whole thing comes crashing down. And I'm the world's worst at that, because I have big fingers, and big fingers don't like all that stuff. So anyway... So in our text, Paul says the empty tomb is like one of those Jenga blocks, all right, that holds up the entire tower. And without it, I mean, if you were to pull it out, our Christian faith comes crashing down. Look back at our text again and see what Paul says. If Christ has not been raised, if he has not been raised, then our preaching is pointless. I waste my time. You waste your time when you're out sharing the gospel. It's pointless if Christ has not been raised then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins and so without this foundational resurrection block can you see the blocks falling apart listen to me this morning if you don't believe in the resurrection if you don't believe that that tomb is empty this morning then your world is falling apart Amen. and you're going to continue to fall apart in this world and if you don't live daily knowing that this tomb is empty your world falls apart that's the faith in Jesus block that we hold on to. This forgiveness of sins block. But let's take a freeze frame for a moment. Let's think about this. Hit the pause button for a minute. Put that resurrection block back in to the game. Because Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And the fact that he is, the fact that that Jesus is, listen, the only person to ever have to borrow a tomb. He borrowed this tomb. means our faith in his ability to forgive is also verified. The tower, the walls of our faith, they stand firm. Our game, our, our, our Jenga game stands firm. Jesus' tomb is empty for he is risen indeed and he 
comes with that power to prove that. Because of his resurrection, listen to this, he is the only, it, is the, it proves that he was the only one qualified to die for our sins. Yeah. And, he, and, and he did so. This means that all of our sins, our past sins, our present sins, our, our future sins have been forgiven. They've been forgiven. When you think about your sins being forgiven, and you're here this morning, that's a reason to celebrate. Amen. It's a reason to celebrate. In fact, if you have a sin in your past that you, you wish that you could erase, if you have a sin in your past that you wish you could erase, would you raise your hand? All of us. 100% of us. We all have those sins that we wish that we could erase, that we were ashamed of, and, 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 and that we wish that we wouldn't have committed. But when we look at this empty tomb, those sins can be washed away. And I hope you understand better now the importance of the empty tomb. Everything about our faith, everything that, that we put our stake in, everything about our faith as Christians is built on what happened on the third day. Jesus' resurrection not only validates our faith, it marks us out as the only true faith. Listen, that, that this week I read about a Muslim college student, and I had the opportunity last week to interview uh, someone of the Muslim faith for a world religions class I'm doing and interview them and talk to them about our faith. But this Muslim college student who came to believe in Jesus Christ, one of his friends was shocked when he asked him this question, why did you become a follower of Jesus? And here was his response. It's simple, really, this guy said. Imagine that you're walking down a road and you come to a fork in the road and there are two people, right, there to follow as your guide along the way. Two people. You come to this fork in this road. One of them is dead, laying there lifeless, and one of them is alive. Now, which guide are you going to follow? And that's what this guy said was the changing point in his life to realize, look, Jesus is the real deal. Indeed, who would put their faith in a dead person anyway? I wouldn't. I would put my faith and put my stake in the only person that ever beat death. And therefore prove that he is the authority to forgive us for our sin. That's what he does in his death and burial and resurrection. And he's able to forgive our sin. Here's the second reason we celebrate the empty tomb this morning. We celebrate the power of God. It's his power that lives within us. The empty tomb is a reminder that God's power is limitless. There's no end to his power. There's no end to it. If you, if you think about it, there's, there, there's nothing that can ever stop the power of God. Nothing. Let me ask you this. Do you believe it's possible for selfish people to be made unselfish? Do you believe it's possible for immoral people to be made moral, to be given self-control? Is, is it possible for cruel people to be made kind and for some sour people to be made sweetened? Wouldn't it be marvelous if that were possible? I mean, think about it for a moment if that one person who is the most irritating to you, don't say their name out loud, but you know you all have one, someone that's the most irritating to you, right? They are self-centered, they're prideful. They're so hard to be around. You can't stand being around them. They're always saying hateful things. They have gossiped about you behind your back. Been really mean to you. And you can never imagine that person becoming a good person. It's hard for you to even fathom to think about. But let me tell you this. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we know the kind of change that is possible. There is nothing that God cannot change in a person's life. Amen. It proves God has the power to change human nature, to change human beings. Just look at the, the story of Paul. He has the power to transform you and me into the image of Jesus Christ, to be made like Christ. And this is what Paul was talking about. This is what Paul was referring to when he said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new person. The old has gone and the new has Come. And Paul knew this was true by experience. 
And that same resurrection power which God displayed in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead, listen, is available to us today. He has raised us from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. I don't know if many of you know uh, the band Mercy Me. Has anybody ever heard of Mercy Me? Has anybody ever heard the song I Can Only Imagine? It's a very, that's, that's a wonderful song. Brings tears to my eyes every time I hear it. And Bart Miller, who's the, it's the story, they did a movie about him, if anybody's ever seen that. He was born on December 1st, 1972 in Greenville, Texas. To the casual observer, his childhood looked perfectly normal, but it wasn't because of Bart's uh, formative years that were marked by abandonment. It was marked by physical abuse. He went through a lot when he was younger. And Bart was primarily raised by his father, okay? His name was Arthur. And his mother was named Adele, and for years they had a great marriage. But one day Arthur was accidentally run down by a semi-truck while on the job. And miraculously, he didn't break a single bone in his body. But his brain, on the other hand, was, was severely damaged and could not be repaired. And it left him in a coma for about eight weeks. And after the accident, Arthur changed. His brain injury, that it left him broken. It left him uh, to where he would have these, these, these fits of rage in his life. He would be set off by the most insignificant thing. He never laid a finger on his wife, but he would intentionally break everything that meant anything to her and to their son, Bart. Very destructive. Tore stuff up all the time. And eventually, Adele, she buckled under the weight of his verbal and emotional and, and psychological abuse. And as far as she could see, that she had no choice. And so she left. And Bart was in the third grade at that time. And outside the home, no one saw the man Arthur had become. It was no one saw this. And all they saw was a was a flighty mother who had turned her back on her family. But what we see on the surface doesn't always tell the whole story, does it? And when, the, when Adele left, Bart became the focal point of his father's uncontrolled anger. Spankings gave way to full-on beatings, right? And Bart's dad becomes an irredeemable monster to his son. He was off the chain, bad, horrendous, terrible person, right? And in Bart's mind, his only hope was to grow up and to get out and to move on, which he, he did. He grew up, got out, moved on. But something happened, right? Bart's dad ended up getting pancreatic cancer. And that led Arthur to turn to Jesus. It's a remarkable story. And he started going to church. He read his Bible regularly. He asked Jesus to forgive him for his life of sin. Forgive him of the way he treated his family and his wife and his son. And he asked Jesus to come into his heart and to be his Lord and his Savior. And what did our Lord Jesus Christ do? He did just what was requested of him. He came in and he saved Arthur. And what happened after that? I'm going to tell you what happened. And this is the power of the resurrection right here. What happened after that is this monster that was known as Arthur Midler disappeared. The monster disappeared. Jesus came in and he transformed Arthur from the inside out. And today, when you when you talk to Bart, he describes this as his, he describes his dad as listen to this. This is amazing. The godliest man I ever knew. After everything that he went through, he describes his dad as the godliest man that he ever knew. And when, when his dad died, Bart, the lead singer there, Mercy Me, wrote a song called I Can Only Imagine. I Can Only Imagine. And that change that is made possible, listen, by the power of Jesus Christ, by the power of his resurrection, by the empty tomb, you and I can be changed. 
You and I can have hope. We can be restored. And that is what's worth celebrating. Amen. That is why we can leave out of this place today and we can celebrate the risen Lord. Amen. One more thing about Jesus' empty tomb here is the triumph of God. The triumph of God. Jesus' resurrection, listen, shows us that God can and has defeated our greatest enemy. He has defeated our greatest enemy. What is our greatest enemy? Death itself. Death itself. You know what? I'm going to tell you right now. Here's something that you can take to the bank. All of us are going to die. Amen. We don't know when. We don't know when that, that date has been etched out for us. But I will tell you that we're all going to die. In Psalm 89, 48, we find a question that we all know the answer to. And this is the question. Who can live and not see death? Or who can escape the power of the grave? Everyone can point to themselves and say, not me. <laughs> I can't. Right? Young and old. Good and bad. Rich and poor. Doesn't matter. No one of us is exempt. We all die. Now think about this stat. Nearly two people a second. More than 6,000 an hour, more than 155,000 every day, and 57 million a year. And you don't know when your name is going to be called. Just think about that. The finest surgeons that we have might enhance your life for a little while, but it cannot ever eliminate death. Death will happen. As Hebrews 9.27 says this, take it to the bank, people are destined to die once. Right? That's the fact, plain and simple. But Jesus' resurrection, the empty tomb, takes away this fear. There's no reason to fear, right? Hebrews 2.15 says this, Jesus came to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. And so at Easter, we always recall those first words that Jesus uttered when he, when he returned from death. What did he say? Fear not. Fear not. He put it in John 14. He says this, because I live, you will live also. Because I live, you will live also. So we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because it defeats our greatest enemy, and our greatest enemy is death. Because death no longer is something that we need to dread. Amen? Amen. In fact, Jesus' resurrection removes the reason for us to fear anything whatsoever. As Paul says in our text, if only in this life we have hope, then we are all people to be pitied. But we don't only have hope for this life. We are to be, we, we have hope because Jesus Christ is risen indeed. And Jesus' death and burial and resurrection defeats death. And it takes away its ability to hurt us, to cause us to fear because when we think about Jesus' resurrection, it turns death into nothing more than a doorway to a far better place. And this is the main reason we celebrate that empty tomb as Christians. And if you think about it for just a moment, we're reminded of a, of a scripture just a few short uh, verses down. The Bible says this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is in verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, listen to this, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put on, in, put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall we be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? I'm going to tell you right now, because Jesus took the sting of death for us, we have nothing to worry. Let me ask you this question this morning. Have you put your tr trust and faith in the empty tomb today? If not, I can't think of a better time and place than on Easter Sunday morning to put your trust and your faith in the empty tomb. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.
for this day. God, you truly give us a reason to celebrate today. Father, may we never, ever get over the empty tomb. In fact, God, may we be reminded each and every day of the importance of your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Father, I pray today that if there's anyone in this room that's never trusted you to be their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day. God, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, we love you, and I just pray that during this time of invitation that we would just be obedient to whatever it is you're calling us to do today. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand for our time of invitation? So if you uh, haven't given to that yet, just pray and ask the Lord to lead you in that. Um, I believe that's about it. Does anybody have any other announcements before we dismiss? Don't forget our Bible school. Bible school. There is a flyer in the bulletin today about Bible school. Go ahead and start praying and asking the Lord how you can help out with that. Um, we always have a big crowd for Vacation Bible School, which is exciting. Any other announcements before we dismiss? Yes, yeah, a uh, pray for Chris and Dalton. Um, we need to remember Cicely, she had, uh, she has COVID and she had a febrile seizure last night. She's fine. She's back at home, but we need to remember her in our prayers. Okay. Cicely. How's um, Jerry doing? He's Jerry. Depends on who you ask. Yeah, yeah. See, I think, I think it is getting his sugar under control. We, uh, I forced him to call the doctor and he is now on insulin. So we're working on getting that regulated and Megan was diagnosed diabetes diabetes right okay all right okay let's remember all of them in, in our prayers hope y'all have a wonderful Easter Sunday afternoon Roy would you dismiss us this morning Father we thank you for this day and we thank you for all that it means to us Lord we thank you for the sacrifice of your son and we celebrate his resurrection today. Lord, please help us to keep the spirit of the resurrection, not only for today, but throughout the year. Lord, we ask that you bring comfort to families who are grieving, bring comfort to those who are sick, bring recovery to them. Lord, we just ask that you forgive us where we've fallen short of your glory and help us to walk 
in the example that Jesus set for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.